On behalf of our team at RDIEC, my name is Jeff Cameron and I would like to welcome Mr. Doug Martins. Uh, Mr. Martins is here today um, to talk about Estevan Meter, his company that he has uh, started. Uh, for all the kids out there, I'd just like to uh, mention that if you have a vision or you're, you're thinking of doing something, something uh, going ahead and you kind of have a dream about something you'd like to do, even starting your own company, I think Doug is a shining example, not only of someone that started his company, but expanded into other, other areas. And uh, yeah, he was uh, be someone you could talk to. And when you're coming out of high school, it's just uh, something that you could uh, think about that when, when you look at what he has accomplished, uh, it is uh, actually quite quite amazing. So before we begin though, students out there, if uh, you're interested in, in leaving a, a little note on, on the presentation, you can uh, go to our website uh, and uh, click on the QR code or you can go to www.rdiec and you will be automatically entered to win a $50 gift card. Anyhow, uh, Doug, Thanks so much for joining us here today and uh, sharing your knowledge with the students and uh, take her away. Good morning, everyone. And, and thanks so much for the kind words, Jeff. Uh, and just a, a, a slight correction to Jeff's comments there. I, I have started some businesses. Uh, Estevan Meter is not one of them. Estevan Meter was founded in 1967, which was uh, before I was born, but I, I did, uh, joined the company as an employee and later became an owner and I guess it's uh, reasonable to say that I was integral to the growth of Estevan Meter and along the way I have you know largely turned into an entrepreneur and started some other companies so uh, my discussion today I'm, I'm just going to share a little bit about my career my personal career path uh, I'll get into a little bit of conversation about our our, our company uh, with a company overview and talk about some of the people that we employ within our business, uh, which are largely uh, focused around the technical trades of instrumentation, uh, gas or steam fitters, and the electrical trade. Uh, and then I'll, I'll talk briefly about various industries. We, we do work primarily in the oil and gas industry, but we do do some work in other industries and you know talk about what kind of opportunities exist uh, within those jobs uh, as tradespeople. Uh, I got my high school diploma in Oxbow, Saskatchewan at Oxbow Prairie Heights School uh, and I, I went on to go to school at what at the time was uh, had just changed from STI, the Saskatchewan Technical Institute, and became SIAS Palliser Campus which today I believe is uh, SAS Polytechnique in Moose Jaw. I got my instrumentation engineering technology diploma in 1990. And uh, coming, coming from there, I, I did a short stand at the co-op upgrader in Regina. And then I got employment at Estevan Meter Services in 1990. And that was sort of my first job out of school. And I've been here ever since which is a bit of an anomaly in today's world. Many people have many different careers, uh, which is great. Uh, within working at Estevan Meter, I think I've had the opportunity to do many different things. So it's, it's been a good path for me. Uh, in the mid nineties, as I'll call it kind of a side hustle, I did start another company called 3D Maintenance Limited, which I was an owner and partner and, and did some work at. It was a, a maintenance business within the oil field uh, servicing pump jacks and, and doing construction crew maintenance and that type of thing. I, I sold that, my shares in that business out in 1998 and it went on to exist for many years. It's still in existence, but it, in existence today, but it's largely wound down. Uh, in 2000, I always kind of had an entrepreneurial spirit, I guess. I had the opportunity to buy some stock or some shares in the company that I was working at, Estevan Meter. Uh, and I later went on and around, I think it was 2008, uh, became president and CEO of the company. Uh, and from that, we, you know, we, we grew our companies. We formed another one in Manitoba with some other partners called Burden Meter Services. It's an affiliate 
Uh, in 2015, I was uh, asked to join the board of an ex uh, oil field exploration and production company called Fire Sky Energy, and I've been a director or a board of director in that company since 2015. Uh, in, in 2017, I gathered some other partners and we started an electrical company, which is also an affiliate of Estevan Meter. It's called Apollo Electric and Controls Limited. I'm the president of that company as well. Uh, and along the way, you know, because of some of my good fortune in business, I felt it's very, I, I truly believe in the law of reciprocity, uh, which means that you get exactly what you give into the world. And I felt it was very important to give back into our communities that we, we do business in. I was involved with the Moose Creek Regional Park, which was a new regional park formed in Southeast Saskatchewan, uh, the Moose Creek Gulf golf course. I was a founding member there. I've just recently resigned and about a month ago from that position, but I was involved in that for about eight, both of those entities for about 18 years. Uh, I was a founding member for the Estevan U18 AAA Bears hockey team that we, I'm very proud to say we recently brought to Estevan, Saskatchewan, a, a AAA U18 boys hockey team. Uh, and I'm also the Saskatchewan chair of the Canadian Hydrocarbon School of Measurement, which is related to our business and uh, is a nonprofit organization that it's, it's an industry organization that shares information about hydrocarbon measurement across Western Canada. A uh, couple things that I just, I wanna point, point out to a lot of the students, you know, that are, are looking to pick a career, a uh, very hard thing to do when you're an 18 year old guy or girl, uh, hey, what am I going to go do? You probably have your parents making some suggestions to you. And, you know, it's, it's probably a tougher challenge in today's environment. The, with the information age upon us, the, the career challenges that are out there are ever changing. And, and you know, the only thing I can say is uh, to students is you, you want to be a lifelong learner. Uh, you probably are, are, if you're not willing to continue to learn, your the opportunities will probably uh, be less available. But if you're willing to accept that, uh, you'll probably have great opportunity. When I chose my career, I really, really didn't know what I wanted to be. My parents told me I should go to school and do something. Uh, I thought I wanted to be a hockey player, but I, I don't think I was good enough to play in the NHL. So my dad told me you better go get a job or go to school. So I happened to come across instrumentation engineering technology. I really didn't know a lot about it. Uh, it happened to be the only class in Moose Jaw at the time that wasn't a co-op program. It was at that time a straight two-year program. Uh, and I, I knew I wanted to get through school as quickly as I could and get, up, get into the workforce and get making some money. So I picked that one. Uh, really for no other good reason than that. Uh, and I also knew that if I did go to school, I, I didn't have to do that, you know, what I went to school for. I didn't have to stay in that trade for the rest of my life. And that's another piece of advice I would share with any of the students out there that it's maybe not so important what you pick, but it is important that you pick something. And as an employer today, when I have people that come to me looking for employment, uh, anyone that does have a degree or a diploma, it's a indi strong indication to me that they're willing to learn. So those people get viewed, you know, with maybe a little bit of preference over people that have grade 12 education. Uh, that it's an indication that they are capable and willing to learn. And, and we, we do hire people that don't have a post-secondary degree or diploma as well. And those people, you know, we we encourage them to learn and develop their skills in the company and they go on to do great things. So uh, again, it's not so important what you pick, but you know, if you are looking at going to post-secondary education, uh, pick something you can change along, along the way of your, of your schooling uh, and, or you can finish your schooling and get out in the workforce and you can change careers along the way. Uh, you don't have to be locked into one thing and, and don't let that scare you, I guess. Just move forward and do something would be my recommendation to the, all the kids out there. Uh, our company, as I, as I said previously, was started in 1967. 
Uh, it was a family owned business and we, we primarily do oil field instrumentation and measurement, uh, controls, programming, that type of thing, excuse me. I'll speak, speak a little bit later in my presentation, you know, to more specifics of what instrumentation people do. Uh, our, our company started as a, a small business with a handful, you know, three or four or five employees and it's growing into, I think we have, you know, 70 plus employees today across uh, all of our group of companies. So we do instrumentation and measurement. Uh, we do combustion services, uh, which is some burners that are used in the oil field. That's where our gas and steam fitters come in. Uh, we have a repair shop. A lot of the people that we employ there don't have post-secondary education and, you know, they maybe have various industry experience or they've come straight out of grade 12 and they work for us and we provide training for them. Uh, and as well, we do electrical construction and maintenance on our Apollo electrical side. So we, we've grown to distribute a large number of products with some uh, arrangements or agreements with some large companies in the world, Brock, Rockwell and Schlumberger. Uh, we do level gauging instrumentation. Uh, Graco is a, a public company that maybe some people have heard of and we do, they, they provide chemical pumps and uh, injection pumps and that type of thing and, and then various other ones that you know products that we support and then our, our field service people go out and install these things and uh, do maintenance and support on them after we've sold those products. So I'll skip over this stuff fairly quickly. Uh, one of the questions that comes up, a lot of people don't know a lot about the instrumentation trade and it's, you know, how, how can I become an instrument tech? And there's a couple venues that you can go down. Uh, one is you can, you can do what I did. You can go to, you know, I believe Nate and Sate, which are also, I believe, Polytechnique uh, uh, schools in Alberta. There's the SIAS campus, or the, sorry, the Palliser campus in Moose Jaw, which is a Polytechnique school. Uh, there's Red River, and, and this is in Western Canada, uh, Red River College in Winnipeg, and you can get an instrumentation engineering technology diploma. And those courses now are typically, I believe, uh, about three years, three and a half years, and they include a co-op program. So you take five semesters of schooling, and I believe there's three semesters of, of uh, work terms or co-op programs where you go get some industry experience. And once you've graduated, you come out as a very strong and capable person that has you know, five semesters of schooling uh, in an engineering technology to program, program, as well as uh, you know, three semesters or approximately a year, year and a half of industry experience. The other path, that you can take is you can go get hired on somewhere with perhaps a guy like me at a company like Estevan Meter and enroll in the apprenticeship program. And how most apprenticeship programs work is there's four levels, uh, kind of a first year, second year, third year, fourth year thing. And you go to school for eight or 10 weeks and then you have to work for a period of time, you know, get a few thousand, couple thousand hours and, and the various trades, there's, there is some variability among them. I think instrumentation, you have to have 10,800 hours uh, and upon completion of your four levels of schooling and acquiring 10,800 hours of trade time, you can challenge the journeyman's exam and you get uh, an interprovincial red seal journeyman status. So the other thing that can happen uh, if you're a journeyman, you'll, you'll be a journeyman and only a journeyman. If you take the technology diploma, you can also go on and gain journeyman status. So as my slide indicates here, technologists can be technologists and journeyman. Journeyman mechanics can never become an engineering technologist. They can only ever be a journeyman. So the the people that take the technology program have a little stronger foundation, they have a little more schooling and some, you know, more technical training, I guess, in terms of some of the, the class uh, information that they take, the physics and the chemistry and the calculus and the communication skills, those types of things. And it's not that one is necessarily better than the other. 
taking the technologist route maybe gets you there a little quicker. Uh, a journeyman mechanic has to learn some of those skills on the job and, and that may or may not take, take a little longer to acquire those skills. So a, a typical instrumentation guy, uh, you know, I, I worked in the trade for probably 10 years before becoming more involved as a business guy or a businessman. Uh, the type of things that we do is we, we calibrate meters. Uh, we do various, you know, level and, and uh, pressure instrumentation and uh, flow instrumentation. Uh, those types of things, there's analytical instrumentation, you know, where we might measure uh, the various components within a gas, or we might, in the oil field, we try to detect hydrogen sulfide gas, which is a hazardous or dangerous toxic gas. Uh, a lot of different things. Uh, and some of it, when you start out, like any job, you kind of you start at the bottom and you got to work your way through. You get the opportunity as you go to learn more technical things and develop your skills further. Uh, I, you know, this slide, I, I'm showing a control valve in the upper right. And on the bottom, it's a, a photo of a, a control panel with a programmable logic controller or a PLC. And we have guys that build those panels and they, they wire them up and it's very technical and then they subsequently do the, the programming, which is a very uh, unique computer language, I guess, programming, industrial computer programming language. And uh, you have to have the instrumentation knowledge to know the, the various devices that are connected to these computers and how they work within a process in some kind of a uh, industrial plant. So some more you know some more pictures the some of the jobs are you know guys as you can see in the background of the one slide there's some, i think a little bit of snow on the ground they're sometimes working outside in the elements and and sometimes you're getting your hands a little bit dirty and it's not all you don't know, start off programming and uh, doing the nice clean high-end work you, you start off fixing valves and you know there's some tubing and plumbing work i would say an instrumentation guy my analogy is it's kind of a hybrid version of being a plumber and electrician, a technical version of being a plumber and an electrician. Uh, but it's, it's a great trade to get in. The, the work is not highly physical. It's more, more mental and a lot of learning. Uh, and, it, and it's a great trade with a lot of opportunity in it. And there's, you know, it, it is a bit of a challenging school to go through the technology program, but it's, uh, uh, certainly not insurmountable and and some of the classes that you know it's people that have an aptitude for for the physics and uh, math classes and that type of thing are typically the people that that uh, would consider that so one of the other things that we employ on our on our combustion servicing side is uh, steam fitters or gas fitters and to acquire that uh, certificate that's a, a <laughs> An apprenticeship program as well and it's sort of that same thing we you know we employ journeyman people so uh, a journeyman can have an apprentice that's a one-to-one -one ratio so we hire an apprentice uh, a young guy maybe that only has grade 12 education and he comes to work for us and he, he said hey Doug I'd like to apprentice as a steam fitter or a gas fitter and we do have some of those people working for us and we enroll them in the apprenticeship program and, and you know, they work for a year and then they go to school for a couple of months, eight, that eight or 10 week time frame that I mentioned earlier. And they do that four times. And at the, at the end of that run, they go and challenge a journeyman's exam and they get their journeyman gas fitter uh, ticket. And from there they can do things, you know, for us, it's, uh, the picture on the right is an installation that a journeyman gas fitter would piece all together so you can see there's some some wires connected to those things it's kind of a technical looks like kind of a complicated thing but uh, once you've got the training i guess it doesn't look that complicated anymore and uh, those guys also have the ability to go on as a gas fitter you can go on to uh, acquire experience in the in the plumbing trade or uh, HVAC trade, or sometimes they'll go into refrigeration, or they can, you know, work in various plants. There's lots of opportunities in that trade as well. And it's, uh, again, uh, 
not a high physical component. There is, you know, you are working with your hands. You are putting some stuff, you know, piecing it together, pipe fitting it together. But at the same time, uh, there are, you know, it is some mental work where you have to understand what you're doing and what you're fitting together. And you work with maybe some, an engineering group or some engineering people that will help give you some direction. And uh, then you're the guy, the, sort of the hands-on guy that goes and makes it work. So uh, this is just another photo of some of the, uh, this piping structure is something we'd piece together and it would feed gas into these large stacks that you can see in this, in this slide. Uh, and we feed gas into those, there's a, a fire tube they call it in there and we, we heat, we heat the process and in the oil and gas industry, uh, what comes out of the ground is it's not oil that comes out of the ground. It's a, an emuls emulsified product of oil, water, and gas. And the product that we want to get to is obviously the oil. So to do that, uh, we add some heat into the system and when we heat it and with, uh, the natural effects of gravity, water is heavier than oil. The water falls to the bottom and the oil floats to the top. And we're, we're able to, with some instrumentation and controls, uh, we're able to sort of siphon that oil off and, and get it into a tank. And then that's the raw product that would go to a place like the co-op upgrader for refining and to the products that we use every day in our vehicles or our tractors or, or whatever, the, the petroleum, you know, hydrocarbon products that we use. So as part of that, you know, we, we have to do some flue analysis. Uh, our oil and gas uh, business is highly regulated in Western Canada. It's, you know, I've had the opportunity to do some work internationally and I can certainly speak to the fact that our, our oil and gas business in Western Canada is the most uh, regulated, and environmentally conscious oil and gas business in the world. We do a great job of it, uh, and I'm, I'm a strong advocate of it. Uh, and you know, part of that process is we do we do flue gas analysis on these combustion systems to ensure that we're not putting a lot of effluent into our environment. You know, we don't want things like uh, nitric 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 oxides and you know sulfuric dioxide and those kinds of things they're they're bad for humans they're bad for the environment so our combustion people uh set these burners up and tune them so that we're not putting that type of effluent uh into the environment and you know we try to reduce our our uh, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide to reduce our carbon footprint which is critical and in, in Canada, and, and this does not happen in a lot of other jurisdictions in the world, in Canada, we're doing a very good job of it. So I guess, uh, you know, I, I feel that our, our contribution to society and, you know, earth, if you will, as a whole is, is very positive, even though the hydrocarbon business has maybe had a bit of a, a, a negative twist to it in the last few years. Our products are still consumed and needed in the world, and, and it's very important that we do a good job uh, to ensure that we're doing that in, in an envir environmentally friendly way. So this is uh, just a, what we call a PNID. It's a piping and instrumentation drawing. Uh, so this is an engineering drawing. I'm going to go back on my slides. Uh, this is what it looks in the real world. Pardon me. This piping is what it would look like in the real world. This is a conceptual drawing that gets created before we go out and build it. So this is what a, a technologist or perhaps an engineering person would create this drawing. Uh, some of our people in our company will create these drawings or will work with engineering companies to create these drawings. And then the steam fitter or the gas fitter would be the guy that goes out and pipe fits this together. And this is just, uh, uh, again, similar thing, but more of a, a cartoon type picture that, that uh, shows some of the, you know, the regulators and the control valves and the electronic, this BMS controller is the electronic controller that controls the gas stream that comes in and, and creates the fire in this burner. 
And, and then within that burner, you know, we use a device called a flu analyzer and we, we do some uh, in, instrumentation analysis on it, I guess, if you will. And, uh, you know, ensure that we're not putting bad effluents into the environment. So just another picture of, uh, of what that piping system, uh, you know, another version of that piping system, what it might look like in the field. Uh, one of the other people that we employ is in our repair shop business. And these guys fix things like valves and, you know, this, this gentleman here in this slide is fixing a control valve. Uh, these, these guys come to us typically with, you know, they may have post-secondary education. They may have a, uh, they may be an industrial mechanic or a motor vehicle mechanic, or they may have a grade 12 education and we train them in house. They typically need to have good mechanical aptitude, uh, you know, need to have some fit for work capabilities that they, you know, are, are physically able to do some lifting and moving around. And it's a very hands-on job and there, there is a fairly, uh, lengthy learning curve to this as well, but most of it's uh, in-house training. Uh, a lot of our business, you know, we have to document all of the things that we fix. There's a lot of quality controls and that type of thing. So some computer skills uh, in today's world, uh, even though this particular component of our business, you don't, you don't need to have that post-secondary education. We still, at the end of the job, there's some documentation that has to go along with the work that you've done. And that typically happens on a computer in today's world. So, uh, you know, developing those computer skills for whatever job you're in is, is very important, I would say, to any of the students out there. So, uh, electrician. So, I want to be an electrician. How do I do that? I don't want to be an instrument guy and I don't want to be a steam fitter. I'm really interested in this electrical trade thing. So, uh, an electrician, again, it's, it's a great trade. Uh, there's a couple avenues you can go down to go down to, to become an electrician. They're both very similar. There is a, a pre-employment uh, electrical training program that's offered. That it's offered at our Southeast College in Southeast Saskatchewan here. Uh, I think it's offered at SAS Polytechnique in the province uh, and, and various other places. That's you, you go to school for a period of time. I'm not sure what it is, you know, a couple months or several weeks, and you get a pre-employment electrical training certificate. From there, you would need to gain employment and enroll in an apprenticeship program. So you can do that and it sort of prepares you, gives you some knowledge and experience to enter the workforce and will give you a bit of a leg up on someone that maybe has no training. Uh, but at the same time, if you have no training, you can come straight out of grade 12 out of high school and, and try to find a job. You know, at a place like Apollo Electric or Estevan Meter Services, and we would, in, you know, potentially enroll you uh, as a as an apprentice. And it's same thing again. It's sort of that four year time frame where you you work work for a year and you go to school for a couple months. Eight, I believe it's eight weeks in the uh, electrical trade, ten weeks in the instrumentation trade, actually. Uh, and again, you need need to work towards having a number number of hours and. You know, you go to school for a year or uh, work for a year, go to school for a couple of months, do that for a period of four years. And at the end of it, you challenge a journeyman's exam and you come out with a, a journeyman elect electrician uh, red seal uh, interprovincial journeyman status. So uh, same thing, though, you know, though, when you start off and a, and a lot of people are attracted to the electrical trade because it sounds very technical. <clears throat> and the one thing I can say, <coughs> excuse me, to any of the kids is that it probably doesn't start off that way. I would say instrumentation does. You get thrown into more technical aspects of the job from day one. Uh, the electrical trade starts off a little tougher where it's a lot more hands-on. And the first tool that you uh, gain experience using might be a, a shovel or a pipe bender. Uh, and at some point, you know, you do arrive where, you know, after you've gained some experience, you'll get to do those more technical jobs. Again, this is a, a control panel with a programmable logic controller in it. And a lot of the electricians will work on programming these devices. Uh, at the same time, you know, and this is a, a couple, a couple pictures of uh, some oil field electrical installations. 
you know, and again, you can, you can see the snow in the background there. Uh, kids, you know, this stuff may get installed in the summertime when the weather's nice, but it might get installed outside in the wintertime when the weather's very cold and it's, you know, small wires that you're terminating and you, you, you're not wearing gloves and, uh, you know, it's not, it's, it's not all glamorous, but at the same time, uh, there's good days and bad days to any job, I guess. And it, it's a great trade that, you know, after you've, uh, uh, you know, spent your time, a lot of these cables have to get buried in the ground or, you know, you'll see some of the, the piping that's on these things that that has to get, they have to get bent and a pipe bender. Uh, you have to, you know, this left, the photo on the left shows some cable tray with some cables in it. Uh, those cables have to get pulled and installed and, and fastened into those trays and they're very heavy. So again, there's some, there's some physical fitness requirements that when you start out as an apprentice or a young journeyman, you know, you're doing more of this hands-on. It's a little bit more labor intensive, but uh, typically that's early in your career, you know, hopefully when you're young and fit and able, able-bodied to do it. And, you know, eventually you'll, you'll migrate to, uh, doing some of this more technical stuff that I showed on the previous slide where you're doing programming and terminating maybe in a warm uh, master control center or what they call an MCC building. And it, it's more of the technical stuff. So, uh, you know, within all of these traits, there's a lot of different avenues that you can go in. Uh, oil and gas is obviously the one that I'm very involved in. Uh, our company, I'm told by uh, Mr. Mike Hillsdall, I think is the department head that, uh, SAS Polytechnique and Moose Jaw, I think we're one of the largest employers of instrumentation graduates that, and, and, you know, and part of that is the requirement for the oil and gas industry in our province. But there's a lot of other different jobs that, you know, you can work in uh, breweries, you can, in the instrumentation trade, you can work in, uh, uh, there's a fertilizer plant that we do some business for in, in Brandon called Coke Fertilizer. There's potato processing plants, there's food and beverage processing plants, uh, hospitals, petrochemicals, aeronaut uh, aeronautics, a lot of different avenues that you can go in in the instrument instrumentation trade. And likewise with the uh, uh, electrical trade, you know, it, it, it's not all oil and gas, there's residential, you know, every, every home needs, obviously has an electrical component to it, uh, commercial buildings, uh, you know, and then every industrial, every industrial plant, there's uh, a need for electrical people. And, you know, likewise with the, the steam fitters or gas fitters, there's a lot of opportunity in industrial applications. As I mentioned, you can, you know, each go into HVAC or plumbing, heating and plumbing, that type of thing as well. So, uh, you know, and, and within any of those trades, you know, it, it doesn't have to be hands-on stuff either. You can get into sales aspects. You know, I, we, our business has, uh, four or five inside salespeople. And some of those people are uh, journeyman instrumentation people. So they're, they're specking, uh, you know, choosing or specking instrumentation components. They're selling them to customers and it's, it's kind of a industrial or commercial sales side of the business. Excuse me. Uh, you can go on to own your own business. You know, that's, I was very excited to be an entrepreneur, uh, a lot of it's it's not something that you know careful what you wish for i would say to some of the kids it's it's challenging and not everyone has a stomach for it but it's it's been a great life for me you can get into inspections you can work work for large companies to do purchasing of these products and you need to be knowledgeable in purchasing those products so some you know quite often larger companies will hire instrumentation or electrical people uh, or or steam fitters or gas fitters to procure those products and uh, you know, oversee uh, or supervise as well the people that are installing them. You can get into being an instructor. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different opportunities within a lot of different industries. And I, I quickly looked up uh, in the US, USA Bureau of Labor Statistics that the electrical trade is projected to grow eight by 8% 8 per year over the next decade. Steam fitters are projected to grow 4% per year and instrumentation is roughly the same in that three to five percent per year 
uh, over the next decade up till 2029, 2030. So there's, there's, uh, there's some demand growth within the trades. They pay well, uh, you know, a, a journeyman instrument mechanic, mechanic or a journeyman electrician can, you know, when they're a, a young journeyman can anticipate, you know, earning in the $30 an hour neighborhood uh, upwards to the mid $50 an hour neighborhood. So, you know, with overtime, if there's some overtime, uh, you know, you're above, probably above the statistical average of household income. Uh, they're, there's, they're great jobs. They're not real labor intensive you have to use your brain a little bit uh there's good growth opportunity and you know i would say great opportunity within any of those trades and i would you know i would encourage my own kids and i would encourage anybody to consider the technical trades as a career path so that that's my slideshow guys uh, i'll stop sharing and i guess if there's any discussion or questions hi. i'll hand it back to you hi doug uh Thanks so much. That was a wonderful presentation, uh, just packed full of knowledge and uh, opportunities for kids. One big thing, if the, the students out there that watch us and even the uh, teachers, make sure to get out there and uh, share it. And I, I think the biggest opportunity that I could hear from your presentation was that you're telling kids if they have an interest, come and see you and you're willing to work with them and they don't have to go to school four years straight every day they can they can work away learn the trade and then go and take four months of college or, or, or three months and then come on back and and uh, obtain their journeyman uh, that way and in the end when you mentioned the, the electrical trade growing I mean obviously uh, we're getting away from a lot of different things and electricity is going to be a big thing moving forward so listen up kids I think Doug's uh, you know, the, the knowledge that he's given you today and, and talked about the opportunities is unbelievable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. And, and yeah, for sure. I mean, if there's any kids that, you know, we, we do have kids that reach out to us and have questions and I'm, I'm happy to help. You know, we, we do some sponsorship at, at SIAS. We work closely uh, with the instrumentation and the electrical group there and, and supporting them and uh, you know, doing some contribution back into the instrumentation lab and that type of thing. And we, we do, you know, career day at the local high school. Uh, we support that. And some of my, my management team will go and, and chat at the school with the kids to give them some insight. And uh, I'm happy at any time to help a kid out if they're interested in it and, you know, want to talk a little bit more about it. What, you know, what, what exactly will I be doing? Uh, we're happy to help with that. Uh, and, and you hit a bang on the head, Jeff, that sometimes there is some barriers for, for kids for post-secondary training. And, you know, the apprenticeship programs are excellent opportunities for that, that you can, you can go and work, make some money, and then go to school. And at the end of the day, you end up with some training and an opportunity for an excellent career path that has, uh, you know, really has endless opportunities. So you, you can take it wherever you want to take it. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. Do you have uh, very many women uh, working in, in the trades in, in your company? Uh, that's something we've been fighting as shop teachers for a million years is to explain to girls that they can do these jobs and they could be very, very good at them. Uh, we, we have had some, Gordon. Uh, you know, it's traditionally it's been male dominated and uh, you're asking me a, a bit of a Jordan Peterson type question, I think there, and, and I mean, you see it and uh, it's, it's uh, you know, relates a little bit to what the underlying or inherent interests, you know, of, of the two sexes might be, you know, what, what they excel at in school. And then, uh, you know, I'm sure the kids today is when I went to school, uh, you, you sort of do the career aptitude testing and it's, hey, you might be good at this and hey, you might be good at that. So we don't see uh, as many females in it. There are some and, you know, there were some when I went to school and they've done, they've done very well in it. And I would encourage any girls uh, to certainly consider the, uh, you know, the technical trades, you know, the instrumentation, we probably see it a little bit more than on the electrical side, but you know, there's certainly, we have had some uh, uh, female electrical apprentices, but it, it is unfortunately largely male dominated. 
uh, but it, it definitely doesn't need to be that way. There's, there's, uh, you know, if a, if a girl has an interest and has the aptitude to do it, there's certainly no barriers there at all. And, you know, we're, we're an equal opportunity employer and, and most businesses in today's world, world are, and it's, uh, you know, there's great opportunity, great opportunities exist for the, for the girls as well as the boys. Thank you. That's that's really important message to get out to the to the young women is that these opportunities are not just for boys. They they, they are great opportunities uh, for them as well. And the jobs uh, uh, are totally doable uh, yeah. by both sexes. Not uh, not limited. For sure. Um, so when it comes to uh, your uh, apprenticeship, it sounds like you've got quite a few apprentices in different areas. I, I want, just want to thank your company for doing that. Uh, it makes a huge difference uh, when, when companies open up their doors and apprentice young people. Thank you, Gordon. Yeah, I mean, we work closely with the apprenticeship board. Uh, there are some potential changes. I'm hearing some rumblings that they may, uh, you know, in the instrumentation, typically it's a one-to-one -one ratio of journeyman to apprentice, which is, uh, uh, you know, a, a good, a good fit or a good pro program. You get that uh, mentoring model in place very strongly in the instrumentation trade. We have seen some exceptions where the, the trade branch has allowed us or the apprenticeship branch has allowed us to have two apprentices with one journeyman. Uh, the electrical trade has been a little more restrictive or tightly managed around that, but I am hearing some rumblings that they may, uh, be giving some consideration to allowing two apprentices to one journeyman and you know that that we'll wait and see what that happens if that happens i don't want to speculate too much but it, you know the uh indicator of the of the growth within that trade may you know that may be a symptom of what's going on there that excuse me it's not just you know our oil and gas industry but as jeff alluded to there's you know, I think I think the electrical business is something that's going to be around for a long time. Uh, I'm still a firm believer that our oil and gas business is going to be around for a long time. I, you know, uh, it's only in Canada that we seem to uh, be under this misconception that oil and gas is going to go away sometime soon. And uh, the simple fact is that's that's not a reality. It's not possible. Uh, it, it oil and gas will remain part of the energy mix, but there will be other alternative energies that are introduced and the electrical trade is a trade and instrumentation as well are both trades that will fit into you know whatever those sources of energy are the the reality is that uh, our global population needs and consumes it, it's growing because of our ability to produce energy and it will continue to need energy uh, and our pop you know our population is projected to have some pretty strong growth right out till 2100 so anybody that we're speaking today i don't think needs to be real concerned concerned about what happens beyond 2100 or the year 2100 but uh, uh you know there's certainly good opportunity that will exist between now and then for any of those technical trades Well, Doug, uh, unless there's any other questions, I'd just like to thank you so much uh, for the presentation. Such a great job. And Okay, well, thank you guys and uh, all the best. And uh, again, any, any of the students, if they have any queries or questions, you know, we're, we're happy to uh, have them reach out directly. So thanks, guys.